Imagine if oppression took the shape of an airline flight. The airline owners, pilots, flight attendants, and other staff are team oppressors, and the passengers, well, they're team oppressed. What sort of language tools do you think this airline company would develop to ensure that each flight cruised the friendly skies as if on automatic pilot with few delays, cancellations, and objections? Language tools that would make the oppressors calm, relaxed, and at peace about their participation in a system that harshly and constantly mistreats its travelers, and that would make the abused passengers to accept their traumatic flight arrangements as a natural and normal part of life. Quite simply, oppressors would invent language tools that would create an outcome of heads oppressors win and tails the oppressed lose with every flip of the coin. And if anyone complained, well, they could just shut the f*** up. I love women, but they're extremely primitive. They're basic. I'm just saying we're the law of the United States to be the foot almost to death. I want five years. My KKK people will. According to the website Rabble.ca, oppressive language is any word that uses an identity or an identifier of belonging to a certain group, class, race, sexuality, ability, gender, etc., as a negative or undesirable quality. However, there are other types of oppressive language beyond using abusive words to harm oppressed groups. These other types include oppressive language toolsets, which are rhetorical cliches that are designed to protect and maintain an oppressive system. And these cliches often read pages from the same playbook. They operate by using flawed arguments, such as appeals to religion and nature, blaming the victim, false equivalence, omission of facts and context, distraction and self-centering, silencing the oppressed, and plain old truth distortion, also known as lying. In this documentary, we will examine how these rhetorical cliches are weaponized to sustain three major forms of oppression. Racism, sexism, and homophobia, which is also known as heterosexism. We aim to reveal how these language tool sets are dangerous cogs in the wheels of white supremacy, patriarchy, and hetero supremacy. We begin with a brief rundown of the systemic goals of these three oppressive systems. The main difference between right and left, it has nothing to do with how much government you support has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with whether you support traditional hierarchy or whether you support challenging traditional hierarchy, which means if you're on the right, you, you believe white authority, male authority, straight authority, et cetera, right on down the line is what needs to be in charge because those are the better people. So that explains why you're gonna defend an electoral college system that enshrines permanent minority rule. That explains why you wanna restrict voting because you don't think certain people should be voting anyway. That's the reason you wanna restrict women's reproductive autonomy because they're just women and they shouldn't make those decisions for themselves anyway. That's why you wanna get critical race theory or just accurate history out of the classroom because that empowers the voice of non-traditional leaders, right? Right? We don't want to hear their voices. That's why you want to get rid of, of any discussion of LGBTQ folk, because you want to restore straight supremacy and Christian hegemony. When you talk about Tucker Carlson and the like, uh, this generating a kind of a mythical, uh, all-powerful masculinity that at its root uh, is afraid. It's uh, scared little boys trapped in the bodies of muscle-bound men. What are they afraid of? Abortion is about the fear of the disappearance of the white race. So stop killing our babies and increase our wherewithal genetically. Racial uh, intolerance is about the fear of ceding legitimacy to black people who they fear will do the same thing to them that, we, that has been done to us. And then fear of women is we've lorded over these women 
uh, even when we put them up on a pedestal, it's a kind of frozen Jean Jacques Rousseau 17th century respectability. The moment you shatter the image of an ideal woman for most of these men, you are the B word and you are to be just tossed away. So all that does come together in this hyper masculinist intolerance that is neo fascist that resists governance by anybody except another white man. I think that what we need to realize is that all oppressive language is designed to keep the people who are oppressed in their respective positions in society. What is, in, what is reinforced is a, strat a stratification of race and gender, and it's used to justify keeping people in their place and for them not to question it. Because the minute that you question why you're in this position, and when you question an oppressor as to why you haven't done anything to change this position, then you're met with being gaslit with, oh, well, it's because of your inherent behavior. To say that black people are That's not what I said. You no, know, that is what you said. Are you saying, <laughs> Lamont Hill asked him, are you saying black people are prone to criminality? And he said, yes, of course. Or it's because you're weaker. There's a scripture that says that women are the weaker vessel. We're to treat women as the weaker vessel. That's a Peter talking, mm -hmm. 1 Peter 3, 7. Mm -hmm. Or because uh, this is blasphemous or this is an abomination. I believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. And, you know, Leviticus 20, 13 clearly says, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with the woman, both of them have committed an abomination they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And you know, as a Christian, I believe the Bible and that's where I get my belief. When we think about um, kind of layers of oppression, right? Um, language is kind of at the base layer where um, language is used to set a narrative, um, to set kind of perceptions. These language tool sets are one mechanism to keep systems of oppression up and running. And they are primarily geared to convince members of the oppressing group that the abusive system they participate in is either not so bad or not in existence at all. And these rhetorical cliches are working. When asked, do you agree with the following statement? Discrimination against white people has become as big a problem as discrimination against black people in the U.S., 64% of Republican respondents said white people experience a fair amount of hate or discrimination in society. A global survey in 2022 reported that one in three men worldwide believe that feminism does more harm than good and that, quote, men are more likely to agree that gender inequality doesn't really exist than women, unquote and half the males in the U.S. feel that traditional masculinity is under attack. And as of April 2022, Republican lawmakers have introduced more than 300 bills nationwide targeting LGBTQ individuals because many conservatives fear that gays and lesbians are grooming children and targeting them for molestation. Or they fear that trans individuals are trying to rape straight men and women in gender-neutral bathrooms or that they are trying to dominate women's sports. So instead of focusing on solving problems that LGBTQ members face, such as discrimination and violence, lawmakers and local governments are using language and rhetoric which paints the community as pedophiles. So not only do these rhetorical cliches seek to diminish the impact of oppression or to deny its existence, it goes a step further to suggest that the oppressors are the actual victims, but any cursory look at news headlines and government reports will reveal that racism, sexism, and heterosexism are still harmful, that they have not gone away, and that the victims are people of color, women, and members of the LGBTQ community. <laughs> Kill the niggers! If the law didn't say that 
I couldn't kill the niggers, they'd all be dead! From New York City, punching her 125 times. And that lady, she bothers nobody. To the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, we're scared. Our community feeling um, a, a lot of fear and a lot of pain. One year after the Atlanta spa shooting, Asian Americans still feel under attack. Hey, no! We are tired, so tired of living in fear. The graphic and sickening incidents hard to watch. Just this week, a woman in New York beaten 125 times and all caught on camera. A recent study found nationally assaults against Asians went up a staggering 260 percent between 2020 and 2021. Your staff is speaking Spanish to customers when they should be speaking English. A shocking tirade right in the middle of a Manhattan restaurant. Every person I listen to, he's spoken, he's spoken, she's speaking it. America. An enraged man threatening to call immigration authorities on employees who were speaking Spanish. I pay for their welfare. I pay for their ability to be here. The least, the least they can do. The least they can do. Is speak welfare. English. Police pulled over and handcuffed a family they believed was driving a stolen car. But as Denver 7's Jessica Porter reports, that car wasn't stolen. In fact, Aurora should not have even been looking for a car at all. Terrified children scream for their mother, surrounded by police and detained over suspicion they were driving a stolen vehicle. Why are you now placing these children on the ground, face into the concrete, it's hot, in front of all of us, and screaming at them, and they're telling you they're hurt. Jenny Wirtz was in the parking lot of this shopping center on Buckley and Iliff in Aurora. She says a police car slowly pulled behind the family, and the officer drew their weapon on not just the driver, but the children. Chris Watts handcuffed and head down in court on Tuesday, as he was charged with the premeditated murders of his pregnant wife, Shanann, and their two little girls, Vela and Celeste. We have some new information coming in tonight about what was behind the deadly attack in Montgomery County. A man is charged with murdering his wife after police tell us he ran her over multiple times last week. Raw emotion today inside a Detroit courtroom as Earl Maxwell was sentenced for the cold-blooded murder of his girlfriend. A three-year-old girl alone under a bed not far from where her mom and two siblings were murdered. Police saying the family patriarch, 30-year-old Austin Smith, killed them and shot three other people in a fit of rage and jealousy, telling investigators his religion allows it. Police say a father killed his three children and one other person tonight in a church shooting in Sacramento. Sacramento, California. 19 year old Riley Gall was charged back in May of first degree murder in the death of Central High School cheerleader Emma Walker. The two have previously been in a relationship. A man is behind bars accused of beating his girlfriend to death with a tire iron and then scratching a message into the hood of her car. Topping our news tonight, a couple is dead in what family calls a senseless act of violence. The woman's family says the murder suicide was likely sparked by jealousy. A woman shot in broad daylight. I didn't want to peek my head through the window and then they're still shooting. A couple riding scooters down Northside Drive attacked after telling a man driving by to stop catcalling at victim Miera Mansure. Boyfriend Joan Davis stepping in, asking the man to leave them alone. They went down this street in order to try to divert and get away from him. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the bullets start flying. One of the bullets hitting Mansoure in her shin, shattering her tibia. A chilling attack in Brooklyn is caught on camera. A woman is tossed to the ground and sexually assaulted. What that mean? No, no, I'm underage. Just said, don't. Huh? I'm underage. No, I said, how y'all doing? Don't worry about it. We're fine. We're Why good. you got an attitude like that? He already Shut up. That's not an attitude. That's not an honest. She said no. I look at you funny when she says she's underage and you keep trying to talk to her. Yes. What is wrong with you? The, oh, my God. Yo. It, you know, whenever it's spring that comes on in, 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 in New York, you know mm. what you call that? Mm. Hey, yo, my. Yeah, well, fuck you then, season. That's what it is. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, that's what the season is. <laughs> hey, yo, ma. Come here for a minute. Hey, fuck you then, you ugly anyway. As UIC students pay their respects at a growing memorial to fellow honors student Ruth George, the man suspected of killing her, 26-year-old Donald Thurman, appeared in court. Prosecutors say Thurman didn't know George. They claim he killed her because he was angry she ignored his cat calls. You know, sometimes, you know, you got to call a girl. You got yo, you know, you know, something like that. How would you call a dog? 
Same way. Are you reporting is that girls don't like this? They don't like catcalling. Get the f*** out of here. I don't, I, I, come on. We're just acknowledging that you did a good thing today getting up out of bed. Oh, sweetheart. Yo. They say she don't even know. She probably got headphones on. Another day ruined. We're going to begin with a terrifying video from the Bronx. A woman arriving home from a day at work early in the morning, followed by a stranger into her building. She gets inside and slams the door just in time. If you had a daughter, mm. how would you like it if somebody cat called out to her on the street? If I saw them say something out of line, then sure, I'd react with a, a reaction that a father would. But if, you know. What if they just said, hey, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I would feel a little offended or, you know, get upset at that. I was 11 years old. I was walking in Tompkins Square Park, actually. I was getting lunch with my mom, and this man approached us and approached me. The man yelled at me, show me what those hands can do. And as they passed us, they looked back and yelled, I'm gonna fuck you. I was in a crowd, and he walked up behind me and started masturbating on me. And a man said to me, keep walking, fucking ho. No, no, no. He will- She'll fucking hit I you. I will hit you. He would never. Fucking walk the walk. A minor? on any girl. Dude, any walk woman. The walk, walk, walk. You're a girl. Walk. You're walk a girl. Away. Yes. And? Yes, a girl, not a woman or anything. Yeah. Okay. Show your ass. He complimented it. Get the fuck over it. Don't okay. want someone to compliment yeah. it. If Don't fucking, fucking say anything. It. Don't wear that slutty ass fucking mm. outfit. Can you please go away? I don't want to talk to you. You're a beautiful girl. Okay. Can you go away? I just want you to leave, okay? Just leave me alone. Some free space. Just go somewhere else, okay? This is... Just go. I'm asking you to leave or I will call the police, okay? I don't want to talk to you. I want you to bring something with you. Go away. I will call the police. Which way? I don't give a shit. Call the... I will call the police. <laughs> Fuck off. Anyway, I was walking down the street with my son in my hand, wearing a sweatshirt and tights, and this guy pulled up with his friend um, right beside me. And they asked me, like, oh, can I get your number and everything? And I was like, oh, thank you, but I'm actually engaged. And this, his friend literally said, you lying bitch. You don't even got a fucking ring on, you stupid hoe. All of this with my son in tow with me wearing sweatshirt and tights. I'm so sorry to it, dude. She look like she fucking grown. Dude, she she grown, yes or no? So why the hell is you harassing her, telling her to come to your fucking car? What'd you ask me? Huh? What'd you just ask me earlier? I asked you how old you were. Why would you want to know how old I am? Because I, I was just wondering. I was, like, I, I have no boyfriend. I have no girlfriend. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't just harass somebody walking down I, the street. I, I didn't harass you. 78% of women have experienced sexual harassment in public spaces. Like a suggestive comment. A sexually explicit touch. An inappropriate gesture. Or being followed. And it threatens our self-worth. It takes over who we are. So I want to talk about this because I made a video about how I don't feel safe walking past men I don't know unless I'm with another man. And these were the kinds of responses I got. Basically telling me that I have no reason to be afraid, stop stereotyping men, stop playing the victim, no one would ever catcall me anyway, you name it. Yeah, it's not just in my head. And it's not hypothetical. This shit happens to women all the fucking time. And it's fucking terrifying. That's the point these men are missing. To them, it's just a conversation, but to many women, it feels like a power grab. We're wondering if they're gonna try to follow us home. We're trying to think of ways to end the conversation without offending them so that we don't get hurt. I've been rollerblading for about, what the fuck, 10 minutes. That's my 10th cat call. And a guy has physically, like physically, tried to stop me. Like, I could have fallen. I could have hurt myself. This is what we mean when we say men ain't shit. This is what we're talking about. Case closed. A killer off the streets of Baltimore. Police announced the arrest of the man they say stabbed a transgender woman to death last summer. Early morning last July, officers serving a warrant found Mia Henderson's body in this alley behind Piedmont Avenue. Court documents say the 26-year-old was lying in a pool of blood. Investigators say Henderson, who was previously known as Kevin Long, was stabbed in the chest, arms, and back. It's been seven months to the day since 19-year-old Blaze Bernstein disappeared, never to be seen alive again. 
Now, Samuel Woodward, who is already charged with murder, is facing a hate crime. We will prove that Woodward killed Blaze because Blaze is gay. We do want to update you on the breaking news out of Orlando, the terror attack on a gay nightclub. Right now, at least 20 are dead, maybe more. The shooter also dead. Police say that he was well prepared. He was organized. They do not believe that he was from the area. More than 40 have been taken to a local hospital. I tried to fight back, but he didn't stop until my arms fell to my side and I was totally unconscious. Christian and a friend were heading home for the night when he says a car parked in the middle of the road was blocking his space. He had to honk his horn twice before they finally moved and he was able to park. My friend and I got out of my car. They were waiting behind my car and when they saw us and saw what we looked like, they said, oh, are you two a couple of and used a gay slur. First, a woman approached Christian, then a man, and it didn't take long for things to get physical. Assaulted him, beat him up, left him laying on the ground. When officers arrived, he was still on the ground. All of the involved parties were still there. Christian left bloody and bruised, a gash below his right eye and swelling on his head and body. I'm in a lot of pain, and I'll never forget the feeling of my neck snapping back and forth every time that he would hit either side of my head. It's not mentioned in the report, but Christian says the couple was yelling slurs during the entire attack to the point where he believes that was their main motivation. Now that we've established that all three of these major strands of oppression are indeed real and not the imaginings of oppressed people, let's take a look at some of these rhetorical cliches and analyze how they operate. We begin with a fairly new oppressive language tool set, All Lives Matter. The human race matters. What's the difference between saying the human race matters and all lives matter? Nothing. It's the same shit. All lives matter. And I believe that all lives matter. She talked about black lives matter. Well, to me, you're discriminating against every other color there is. And, all, right, and uh, uh, all lives matter. You're going to hear it once. All lives matter. White lives matter. White lives matter. When I personally say all lives matter, I mean everybody. I mean anybody who's been wrongfully killed. They don't tell you black lives don't matter. That's not what they say. That's not the argument. They hit you with that slick shit. Like, well, all lives matter. White lives matter. <laughs> black lives matter. Asian lives matter. Overnight, a mural designed to spark the Black Lives Matter movement in Oak Park was defaced. Residents waking up this morning to find the words, all lives matter. All lives matter, all lives matter. It no matter what the color is, black, white, Asian, Latinas, and Mexican taste. Hispanic lives matter, blue lives matter. Well, what is so controversial? Here's the problem with everyone who says all lives matter. They don't really mean it. Just look at our history. All lives didn't matter when hundreds of disenfranchised Americans, a majority of whom were black, died during Hurricane Katrina as they pleaded for help from their rooftops. All lives didn't matter when thousands of children in Flint, Michigan were exposed to lead in their drinking water while it took years for politicians to notice. All lives didn't matter when the U.S. spent the last several decades incarcerating African Americans at nearly six times the rate of white people. All lives didn't matter when eight Latinx civilians that you did not hear about were all fatally shot by law enforcement. When people say all lives matter, what they are really saying is the lives of those impacted by racism and xenophobia matter only rhetorically. It feels good to say it, but it's actually harmful because it ignores the ways that people are devalued or killed based on their race, ethnicity, or gender. If your wife asks you like, am I pretty? And you're like, all people are pretty. <laughs> I think everyone's beautiful. You know, do you love me? I love everyone. <laughs> it's probably not going to go over well in your family, right? Your wife is probably going to have a problem with that because what she wants in that moment is specificity. You know, what's desired in that moment is to be seen in her unique experience with you. And that's what Black people are asking for right now is to be seen and our unique experience in the world to actually be seen and valued. The same thing happened with black power in the 1970s. 
power to the people. And I, like, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, you know, it, it, this is a, this is hate speech. It's like, no, you know, it, it, it's it's not hate speech. We're we're talking about equity. We're talking about we're not talking about su supremacy. We're talking about equity. I'm saying I'd like to be on an equal playing field. I'd like to be given the, the, the uh, equal, equal chances, equal privileges, equal opportunities, a right to live my life safely, a right to get a decent education, a right to have decent food in my face. This is basic stuff because my life matters. My life matters. And if you say, no, all lives matter, what I would say is, I believe that you believe that all lives matter, but because I live the life that I live, I am certain that in this country, not all lives matter. I know for a fact, based on the numbers, my life hasn't mattered, that black women's lives definitely haven't mattered, that black trans people's lives haven't mattered, that black gay people's lives haven't mattered, that we could, we could run the list that immigrants' lives don't matter, uh, that I mean, we, we could do that their Muslims' lives don't matter, the indigenous people of this country's lives have never mattered. I mean, we could go on and on and on. So when we say all lives, are we talking about white lives? And if so, then let's just say that. The language that's used, to diminish oppression with all lives matter because a lot of white people, they say all lives matter or blue lives matter when black people started saying black lives matter. It was a direct response to black people calling out that police brutality. And it keeps them from having to examine their own behavior, their own biases and their own systems that they benefit from. We have to keep in mind that all language two sets that maintain oppression are calibrated for the oppressors to win and the oppressed to lose, no matter the conversation. The phrase, all lives matter, is a calculated reaction that protects whiteness. The phrase, black lives matter, simply says that black lives ought to matter, but they don't matter because white people have constructed a society based on black lives not mattering. The phrase Black Lives Matter presents two major problems for whiteness. One, it takes the focus off of whiteness, and two, it actually seeks to hold the white supremacist system accountable for the way it treats black lives. Now, most white people won't count it with No! White Lives Matter! That's obvious racism. So they shout back All Lives Matter, pretending that the word all isn't a substitute for white. A close cousin to the phrase, all lives matter, is the rhetorical cliche of not all, fill in the blank. Not all men, not all white people, not all straight people. Let's take a look. When we speak up about women's oppression and women's abuse, we obviously know it's not all men. But when one in three women in their lifetime are either raped or physically abused by a man, it is enough men. That is enough men to make all women afraid. That is enough men that when I'm walking home alone at night, I have to assume it's all men to keep myself safe. You know it's not all men, but it's enough men to keep us in a constant state of fear and that's how oppression works. On March 3rd, Sarah Evergard was walking home to her house in London when she was abducted and later found dead. When the people found out about this, the police sent out a statement warning all women to not go out past dark. The problem with this is women aren't the issue, men are. So why punish women for problems men have created? So you are in a room with three people and you were told that one of those people is a serial killer. So there is a one in three chance that you may get killed if you stay in that room that night. Are you still staying? Of course not. And of course not all of the people in that room are serial killers, but there is enough of a chance for you to be cautious and leave. And that is what we are saying. One in three women go through sexual assault in their lifetime. Of course it is not all men, but it is enough of you guys that women have to fear. And when you defend yourself talking about not all men, you just look like the creeps that we are trying to avoid. I need you to hear me when I say that threats against women are literally everywhere and they're especially greater if you're a trans woman, a queer woman, or a woman of color. And in case you're not able to relate to that, let me break it down for you. Fear for a woman means something as simple as walking home from a friend's house, standing up to a co-worker at work, or having the audacity to reject a man that hits on you. All these women went to social media, started talking about their own experiences, and a bunch of men saw these tweets and said, how can we make this about us? And that's how the hashtag not all men started trending. It's effectively a hashtag that says, hey, women, I see all the problems you're facing, but I just wanna make it clear, it's not my fault. 
And can I just say, if your first response to something like this is, yo, this is not my fault, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, it probably is. In late 2016, a small amount of Samsung phones started exploding and hurting people. Samsung, knowing that there was a problem with a small amount of their phones, recalled all of their phones to make sure that all of their phones were safe, knowing that it was their responsibility to keep every phone in check. Everyone knew there was only a small percentage of phones that exploded, but were still wary of all Samsung phones. Because whilst they knew that not all phones were going to explode, they definitely knew that some could, and they couldn't tell the difference between which phones were going to explode or not. Can you see where I'm going with this? Let's talk about men who say, not all men. This behavior comes from three sources. First, this is a male pick me behavior. Oh, I understand there are men out there who are acting in abusive ways, but I'm not one of them. I'm one of the good guys. That's a total delusion, by the way. In a patriarchy, everyone has internalized misogyny, sexism, and oppressive ways to treat women. That's why we all gotta unlearn patriarchal ways of behaving. Number two, the need to control women's voices. Notice how they are tone policing women far more than they're mad at those men who are abusing, harassing, and raping women who are giving rest of the men a bad name. Number three, male superiority complex. This would relate to the male pygmy behavior. Oh, I understand there will be awful men out there like who will abuse and rape and harass you and oppress you, but I'm not one of them. If you depend on me to protect you from male violence, you'll be good. That instills in women a fear of independence, that the real solution to the male violence is another man. That's not true, by the way. As far as the language of specifically not all men is concerned, how it reinforces oppression is that it takes the actions of men that aren't actively engaging in those bad behaviors and it's absolving them at the moment for not engaging in those behaviors, but they benefit from the bad behaviors of men by instilling fear in women so like, even if they're not engaging in those specific oppressive or harmful behaviors, women will fear men based on those behaviors that a majority of men will engage in at some point in their lives. Because patriarchy reinforces those behaviors as male behaviors and absolves those behaviors and relegates them to, okay, you know, boys will be boys, or this is just how men are, or, uh, women are emotional, so a lot of times they'll gaslight women into saying that, you know, you have to take this behavior because this is like masculinity. I hate how much you have to coddle white people. Like, it's like, yes, you guys have systemically, continuously oppressed numerous marginalized communities. However, it's okay. Not all white people. Not all white people. So when you say that not all white people are racist, do you think we don't know that? We do. We know for a fact that it's impossible for an entire race of people to be evil psychopaths. It is impossible. However, as much as not all white people are racist, all black people experience racism. Not all white people. What you need to understand is that when I say white people, I'm actually referring to the overarching systems of whiteness. Because yes, whiteness is a system. It is a system of power. Whiteness is not about any single individual. Whiteness is about collective power. Whiteness is a system of power upheld by other systems and institutions, by laws and policies, as well as by culture and language. Yes, whiteness is a social construct that was invented and designed to intentionally marginalize and oppress those of us who exist outside of whiteness in order to benefit, enrich, and elevate those who identify within the system of whiteness. This is why not all white people and reverse racism are not valid arguments. They are simply manipulations of white supremacy intended to deflect and distract from the very real racial inequities and injustices upon which white supremacy relies. 
I get a lot of comments that say, not all white people, stop generalizing. And you saying that proves to me that you're one of the people <laughs> because you don't understand the dynamics of white supremacy because white supremacy is the water that we've been swimming in. So it's not only all white people, it's all people. The difference is that white supremacy benefits you, but it doesn't benefit me. The difference is that white supremacy told you that you were better than, that you were superior, that your skin was better, that you didn't have to change it. You didn't have to hate yourself because of the color of your skin. I did, black people did, other indigenous people had to, Asian people had to, but not you. You didn't have to. So no, not all white people, but white supremacy is all-encompassing. It's everywhere. It's the water we've been swimming in. It's the books that you've been reading. It's the history that we've been told. It's the narratives that we've been told. It's the reality that we've been sold. So unless you have been actively dismantling white supremacy, it's all white people. The language of not all I think is used to assuage people's guilt. Oppressors don't like to think of themselves as oppressors. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it makes them feel like they're not nice people. Um, it kind of erases the systems that are involved in oppression. And so if you say not all men or not all white people, not all straight people, it erases and minimizes the experiences that oppressed groups experience. So that just kind of further op adds to the oppression because now we've recentered onto the dominant group away from the oppressed group and made kind of dealing with issues, talking about the systemic issues more difficult because we've just kind of cut out this little, well, it's not all. So therefore it can't be that big of a deal. When white people say not all white people, or when men say not all men, or straight people say not all straight people, they demonstrate that they are more concerned about their own reputation and the reputation of other members of their own group than they are about the real physical and emotional harm that their oppressive group is visiting upon marginalized people. This rhetorical cliche offers up the shaggy defense. It wasn't me. Yeah, it wasn't me or my relatives or friends, so shut up. It's everybody's favorite game show. I'm not racist, but... You want to say you don't like Asian people? John, uh, look, I'm not racist, but... Correct. I'm not racist, but... You want to say you don't like homosexuals? <laughs> Yvonne. <laughs> Some of my best friends are gay, but... Correct. You want to say you disagree with women becoming priests? Brendan. Hi, I'm all for women's rights, but... Correct. So there's the, the language of the I'm not racist, sexist, homophobic, but inevitably whatever follows that but is racist, sexist, or homophobic. And so it's used to kind of minimize the impact of the second part of that but. It, it, it's also used to kind of uphold whatever the but is as part of that um, kind of the inherent characteristics, the idea that these are characteristics of, you know, this is just how these people are. I'm not saying this because I'm racist. I'm saying this because that's just how it is. Being a member of an oppressing group means that one day someone will point out that what you and your group is doing is wrong and harmful. And when that happens, it makes oppressors feel uncomfortable. They might even feel some shame or guilt. So, one rhetorical cliche that rides to the rescue when the dirty deeds of oppression are laid bare in the open sunshine is the phrase, this is not who we are. I mean, even to the even right now, people who saw January 6th will fix their lips and say, this is not who we are. What are you talking about? We just saw it on television. It's clearly who we are. What are you saying? Donald Trump wins presidency. This is not who we are. Did you go to the rallies? Did you see what was happening on TV? It's clearly a part of who we are. Police kill black men in the streets. This is not who we are. It's been who we are since inception, since day one. Why do we keep acting like we're not this? Because we're programmed to think that we're better than we actually are. And mm. we're gonna have to come to terms with that if we're actually gonna improve. There's this language that, oh, this isn't 
this isn't the United States that I know. This isn't my America. This isn't this isn't who we are. And I think we heard that a lot, especially during the last administration, presidential administration, where like, oh, locking up kids in cages because they came to the country illegally, that's just not who we are. Well, the reality is that is who we are, right? That our country did that. And we have a history of doing that, where we locked up Japanese people in internment camps. And that included whole families, and that included taking away their houses, their land, their farms, their businesses. So we do have this long history of these kinds of things that people say, oh, that's just not who we are. And so that serves that it's just not who we are kind of it serves to minimize, again, the oppressions that people experience. And again, it's kind of used to assuage guilt. And so it just serves to further it, it serves to further oppression because it means that, OK, if that's just an aberration, I don't have to do anything about it. This is not who we are is a truth distortion. What members of oppressing groups are really saying is this is not the lie that we tell ourselves that we are. There is this phrase for truth, justice and the American way. This tagline from the old Superman TV series is a prime example of this lie in action. The American way is to build a country from stolen land from people you first have to slaughter and to build the country's wealth from another group of stolen and enslaved people. This version of America, many of us well know, is who we really are. So, what's worse than racism? Reverse racism. That's worse. A viable system of oppression never wants its right to oppress, question, or challenge. And one language toolset that is often injected into any discussion of freedom from abusive systems is the notion of reverse victimhood. This false narrative turns reality on its head and paints the oppressors as the recipients of discrimination and hostility and the oppressed as the ones who are ever busy stripping people of their rights and humanity. Those in power see minor strides in overall fairness for non-whites, non-men, and non-straights as apocalyptic in scope. And thus, oppressors cast themselves as being on the brink of annihilation, making them the true victims. <laughs> Joe Biden put white people last in line for COVID relief funds. Kamala Harris said disaster aid should go to non-white citizens first. Liberal politicians block access to medicine based on skin color. Progressive corporations, airlines, universities, all openly discriminate against white Americans. Racism is always wrong. The left's anti-white bigotry must stop. We are all entitled to equal treatment under law. We have to realize that within the, uh, the, the, the term and the definition of racism, it, there's accrued power. Like that means like somebody has to have some sort of power to withhold opportunities and privileges from people, right? Black people don't have that in this country. There's no mass, there's, there's not one industry, there's not one form, a, a, a structure, a system where black people can deny any people opportunity. The whole reverse racism, they don't really understand black people can be bigots, but they can't be racist because racism is power and privilege. Let's take a minute to discuss why it's so dangerous for white people to claim they experience racism. The point that's being made is any performance of denying supremacy culture reinforces supremacy culture. So the performance of claiming as a white person to be a victim of some pretend system that literally doesn't exist. We live in the reality of a white supremacist, white dominated country and all of the bad outcomes and problems are from that. So pretending or acting as if you are the victim of some other system of racial domination all that's doing is denying the system of racial domination in existence right now, which reinforces it. Now we have a culture in which there is competition for victimhood and white men now 
many white men are calling themselves victims. Victims of affirmative action, victims of the liberal left. We have these Republican folks who are polled and uh, they say that racism against white people is just as bad or even more so bad discrimination as it is against black people. We hear this language of kind of like reverse oppression, like, oh, like white men can't get a job anymore, right? White straight men can't get a job. And again, I think it is... It's a lack of understanding about how the systems work. It's a lack of um, understanding about kind of like the reality of the situation. If you were to say like, oh, hey, um, you know, you can't, as a white man, you can't get a job. I think there's this way in which people kind of notice where like, oh, if we hire a person of color for a, a job, like, oh, hey, look, there's a person of color getting a job again and we didn't hire a white guy. When you look around and realize that, um, you know, I think it's 92% of the faculty here are white. And so clearly it's not the case that white people can't get jobs anymore. But there's this way that people don't notice that because there's kind of the idea of like white people as the norm. People don't often see whiteness. And so they don't notice when a white guy gets a job. The language of using feminism as reverse sexism against men, like, you know, that brought upon the, the menatist movement. It's used to weaponize feminism to say that we're hurting men, that we're oppressing men, and they're, it, they're making the equivalency to patriarchy. Feminism isn't a system of power, patriarchy is. And because men and just anyone in a dominant group is going to see equality as feeling like oppression, they're going to put women in those positions of saying that a, a, a woman wants uh, retribution as opposed to equity and equality. The roots of reverse victimhood is multi-layered, but two key factors include monopoly entitlement and projection. Dominant groups feel entitled to a total monopoly on several segments of society, such as politics, finance, education, news and entertainment, religion, labor, sexual norms, and family. Any encroachment on that total monopoly, no matter how slight, is seen as an all-out attack on their existence, and they see themselves as victims. The entertainment industry is just one window on how monopoly entitlement works. When Disney makes a live-action remake of The Little Mermaid and casts a black Ariel versus a white one, white people explode with outrage and feel attacked. So what's the thinking behind this? That race is a social construct? <laughs> Hardly. It's elimination of white people, even from our own history and our own fairy tales. Black people are posting videos of their children bursting with happiness when they see the trailer for The Little Mermaid. She's black like me. What about the little white girls who say, Daddy, that's not Ariel. Who cares about them? They can't have their own stories. This is all part of the sick and sickening adoration for blacks and loathing for whites we see everywhere. When Marvel Studios creates a female superhero who is more powerful than Thor or the Hulk, men are incensed and feel their manhood is on the chopping block. And when two lesbians kiss briefly in a Buzz Lightyear animated feature, straight people claim that they and their children are victims of the gay agenda that is trying to turn everyone gay. Oppressor groups also practice projection, copying and pasting their own bigotry and hatred upon the very people who are the actual victims of oppression. This projection is often fueled by a fear that one day the oppressing group will suffer a literal reversal and find themselves at the mercy of their victims. So in a fit of irrationality, oppressors cast themselves as powerless and vulnerable while simultaneously holding almost all the reins of power and control in society. One of the byproducts of oppression is when oppressed people begin to adopt 
the language and ideas that maintain and justify their own mistreatment. This internalized oppression is a valuable asset for the oppressor since most oppressive systems require collaboration from some of the oppressed members. And when marginalized members echo the words of the dominant group, these members make excellent mouthpieces that give validity to the current system. Oppressors can point to those who suffer from internalized oppression and say, see, don't believe us that the system is fair and just. Believe the very people that are the alleged victims of the system. Even they say all is well, and there's nothing to complain about. And, even better, these collaborators condemn any member of their own group who dare challenge the system as the real problem in society. The language of internalized oppression, like, let's just give the example of Candace Owens <laughs> or Kanye West, <laughs> and, you know, that said slavery was a choice. But really? <laughs> it uses the oppression that Black people have gone through and weaponizes it against them so that they feel like they have some sort of white supremacy bargain. I, I, I coined the term white supremacy bargain because it's like a way to say that when Black people behave in ways that would seem to be counter to um, the, the betterment of Black people because they feel like they're going to receive some sort of perks from white people or be chosen as the good ones and be exceptionalized and seen as individuals like white people are. Internalized oppression happens and so often people use their own language against themselves if they're part of an oppressed group where they will set themselves up as the good whatever you know so I'm a good one of the good black people or I'm one of the good gay people because I participate in all the dominant systems I have this high-powered job I make good money you know if I can do all these things then oppression's not real and so that internal that's part of it, internalized oppression is where you kind of believe that if I just do all of the right things, then oppression won't matter. It won't hurt me. Um, and that oftentimes results in people throwing kind of other groups under the bus in the queer community. I think there are groups of um, lesbians and gays that will throw trans people under the bus because they've achieved, if, if people have achieved a certain amount of kind of power and influence, you don't want to lose that. You become accepted by the dominant culture. And I, again, I think it's used to kind of, um, yeah, kind of justify and to, to make people kind of feel better, um, not recognizing that we're all interconnected. And if you start, if we just keep with the example of trans folks, if we throw trans people under the bus, that it won't affect gays or lesbians, but that's not true. It it's used as kind of a way to kind of erode the support for oppressed groups. The language of internalized oppression, and that's called patriarchal bargaining. What some people would say a pick me is. Those types of women or when women get into those situations, they feel that women are inferior. So they think that aligning themselves with patriarchy is going to benefit them materially or that men are gonna treat them better or see them as exceptions because again, men are seen as the default and have the privilege of being seen as individuals. Women are just seen as all the same, like, oh, we're all emotional, we're all, we all just talk and gossip. So, you know, and women will say those same things. And the same thing would go for non-heterosexual people. The, the, the people who are part of that group, let's just say, uh, a gay man doesn't believe in marriage equality, where he doesn't think that gay people should get married. It doesn't benefit him and it hurts the group and it justifies um, the, the unequal treatment of the group that he's part of. Oppressors, they use people that are living with internalized oppression against the oppressed group because they tokenize them and use them as examples. Well, 
if these black people can see that you're inherently inferior or bad or you need to change your behavior and be more like us then it must be true because it's one person that said that and these are the people who are given the bullhorn uh the the internalized and uh, oppressed they're giving they're given a bullhorn and a platform in order to basically say like white people are right and that we are the shining examples because because a white person has patted us on the back and agreed with us and because our, our singular people agree with these white people then it must be true because we're individuals and you know we think like white people and because we think like white people we're the right ones some of the terms that for example black people use where where they're expressing internalized oppression and um they're weaponizing it against black people are like to say that black uh culture is inherently negative or to their to its own detriment because black women are single and because black on one black crime and because black guys didn't pull their pants up and because black people use ebonics all those things are seen by black people to to look down on other black people and to say or to infer that it is blackness that makes black people oppressed that they are the reasons for their own oppression as opposed to systemic oppression